And uh, um, so we are just on time um, to um, for our first presentation, our keynote speech, um, the keynote speech done with the uh, Richard Scudder. Um, let me introduce you. Uh, Richard. So Richard Scholar is professor of French and head of the School of Modern Languages and Cultures at Durham University. Actually, our path uh, crossed as he left Oxford after 13 years to take up the chair at Durham when I contacted him uh, as a, to, to, to be our keynote speaker. Um, his research interests lie in French language and literature, broadly conceived with a particular emphasis on early modern studies, comparative literature, translation and transcultural studies, word histories, and and questions of critical method. He is the author of the Je ne sais quoi in early modern Europe, Encounters with a Certain Something, and Montaigne and the Heart, the Art of Free Thinking. Both books have been translated into French. His co-edition with Eva Sansavior of Caribbean Globalizations, 1492 to the present day, combined with his work on Thomas More, caught my attention, and I would like to thank him again. Thank you um, very much for accepting our ex uh, invitation. Before I leave you the floor, um, uh, Richard, I, I should say that one of your projects brings it into dialogue, translations and reworkings of Thomas More's Utopia from across the early modern world. The book arising from the project, The Inventions of Utopia, is a comparative study of the utopian tradition that emerged in the century following publication of Thomas More's Utopia in Latin in 1516. The project shows how the style of Utopia established Moore's text uh, as a labor la laboratory of ongoing literary invention. Richard Scholar is also an active member of Storming Utopia. Storming Utopia is a contemporary exercise in reimagining uh, more. It is a practical utopianism in several ways, in making a new piece of theater, performing the show in Oxford and Venice, and running events enabling members of the public to engage in the questions of research and creative practice that lie at the art of the project. Richard, please, the floor is all yours. Donc c'est moi qui vous remercie Justine, euh, ainsi que je remercie aussi toutes les mains féminines dont Sabrina vient de parler. Euh, et je passerai tout de suite en anglais pour remercier tous ceux et celles qui sont uh, là aujourd'hui. So thank you to all of you for being here. Putting together migration and borders in the contemporary moment, as the title of this conference does, immediately brings to mind the humanitarian crises that Justine has mentioned, those besetting Mediterranean, but also the US border with Mexico and Ethiopia's Tigray region. We picture physically closed international borders and the migrant lives lost or put in risk in the attempt to move across borders. We reflect on our place in a world divided by inequalities of power and privilege. We're confronted with the intolerable present as described by Patrick Chamoiseau, among others, in his 2016 essay, Frères Migrants. Yet we do so in a conference, the first word of whose title, Utopia, immediately establishes the place in the intolerable present of what Ernst Bloch in his classic utopian study of 1959 called the principle of hope, a principle that thrives on the resources of the imagination, also named in the title of this conference. What new places then might we find for utopia in a world where the process of human migration seems constantly to encounter the border as an obstacle. Well, what I'll be su suggesting in the next 35 minutes or so as a prolongation of the opening act of this conference is that utopianism has not only long been concerned with migration as a theme, but has also been shaped by migration as a process of the inventive imagination, by the migration of words, 
concepts, images and textual forms and of the physical works in which these live their historical lives. So what I'd like to do is to set into historical perspective the key terms in which this conference has been conceived and couched. And I offer this long perspective for reasons of expertise and interest, as well as conviction. I'm a scholar of early modern French and comparative literature, first and foremost, and I'm studying, as just been mentioned, the global history of utopianism in the long century that starts with the publication in Latin of Thomas More's Utopia in 1516. I'm also interested in work on contemporary Francophone writing. And I find that these two areas of interest are intrinsically related by in particular, the transit between them of major themes and forms, not least those at the heart of this conference. Early readers of Moore's Utopia decisively shaped the development of utopian literature and thought. Their most important contribution, which produced a myriad of alternative worlds, was a border crossing culture of invention that saw utopia variously and controversially translated, remade and rethought. And it's this culture of invention, as I hope to show, that I think continues to shape the making of utopias and dystopias to this day. So the approach that my work takes to the questions explored by this conference is characterized by an attention, not just to present figurations of its key terms and concepts, but to the relation between figurations past and present. This is to recognize, as Chamoiseau does in Frère Migrant, that terms like migration are freighted with history. Putting them into that history helps to offer alternative forms of renewal. That's, I think, the promise of utopia, a word that carries so much hope and yet can produce so much disappointment and anger along the way. So I'm going to start um, by, whoops, playing around with my, excuse me, I'm going to start by uh, going right back to the text in which the word utopia was coined, and that's Thomas More's Island Fantasy. I'm going to ask what it has to say about migration across borders. Now, to make the move I'm just making, in other words, to move from utopianism back to, to the work of Thomas More, is to make an assumption that many, including Ernst Bloch, have, and others since him, have resisted to put Moore's work at the center of, of utopianism, essentially. Bloch, in The Principle of Hope, placed the category of the utopian at the heart of hope as a principle that he argued was in the world and yet had been philosophically excluded for so long. To bring philosophy to hope and to bring hope to philosophy meant, as Bloch saw it, broadening the category of the utopian to embrace much more than the history of the text, Utopia, that lent Bloch's category its name. I'll quote uh, Bloch's explanation if I can find the right slide. Excuse me a moment. Here we go, okay. So this is Bloch. To limit the utopian to the Thomas More variety or simply to orientate it in, in that direction would be like trying to reduce electricity to the amber from which it gets its Greek name and, with, and in which it was first noticed. So moving the tradition away from more enables Bloch to collect a wider range of what he calls anticipations, wishful images, hope contents under the sign of the utopian. And that's what he does in The Principle of Hope. The cost of resisting the reduction of the utopian to the Thomas More variety, as Bloch does, is that it reduces Moore's utopia to the status of an inert first instance. It makes it something like the amber from which electricity gets its Greek name and in which it was first noticed. As if, as Bloch implies, the electric current of the utopian had since passed elsewhere. Yet I think there are grounds for feeling that there's plenty of electric electricity left in Moore's utopia. And this is a famous illustration dating from the 1518 edition of Utopia, just two year, years after its first publication. Uh, a famous illustration, I think, of Moore's Fantasy Island, but also of its place 
in the imaginary of world travel. You can see the visitors to the island um, from Europe and the ship in which they traveled at the bottom of the, of the, of the, of the illustration. Moore's work and its reception set a pattern, I'll argue, for the future of utopianism by establishing migration across borders as both a theme and a process of the utopian imagination. At the beginning of book two of Moore's work, the book which describes the island of utopia and its society at length, we're told that utopia, this island, was in fact no island in the first place. It was a peninsula. The first utopian ruler, Utopus, having conquered the country, the peninsula, changed its, geogra its geography decisively by having his utopians use shovels and spades to dig a channel where land met sea so as to make an island of the peninsula. The cha that channel that they dug is now known only to the utopians, so hardly any strangers enter the bay without the assistance of a utopian pilot. This is a society that has surrounded itself with a sea border that it uses to block the arrival of any unwanted migrants. And yet, as we learn at the end of the long section of the work entitled The Travels of the Utopians, and yet, utopian society does see migration as beneficial under certain circumstances. Utopians encourage temporary emigration for the purposes of external trade because, and I'm quoting, by carrying their own cargoes, they, the utopians, are able to learn more about foreign countries on all sides and keep their own navigational skills from getting rusty. Utopians also welcome some immigrants. Any sightseer coming to their land who has some special intellectual gift or who has traveled widely and knows about many countries is sure of a warm welcome. That's why we were received so kindly. Indeed, they love to hear what's happening throughout the world. So that's why we were received so kindly, but. Who is we in this passage? Well, it is, of course, the European travellers to Utopia, whose account of the island we're reading. Thomas More relates at the outset of his book how, during a recent visit to the port city of Antwerp, he met a Portuguese traveller by the name of Raphael Hitlerday with a long beard and a loose cloak. Raphael tells More, during their discussion, of an island on the margins of the known world called Utopia, from which he's recently returned. Of all the many commonwealths, that he's visited, Raphael declares utopia to be the best because all things there are held in common. It's of course left to the reader to work out that this better supposedly alternative island republic of utopia will always be just off the map, just to the west of nowhere. For the Greek derived name of utopia, of course, reveals it to be a no place. The Greek name that more invents for his island re reveals his treatment of the work's themes as charged, electrically charged, you might say, with ambiguity. Take the attitudes I just mentioned of the utopians towards migration across borders. Are we to believe that they were right to cut themselves off from the continent? More, after writing Utopia, went on to lose his life opposing the great divorce of England from the rest of Europe that Henry VIII Henry VIII used the religious politics of reformation to undertake and to justify. The language of divorce has been reactivated in the age of Brexit and Moore's ambiguity has flourished anew. You might think that by separating yourself entirely from the continent, you are creating a scepter dial and a brave new world, but you might instead just find yourself adrift on a nowhere island. And it's only in the fictional space of a nowhere island called Utopia, the 16th century migrants possessed of some special intellectual gift or experience of the world receive a warm welcome. Moore's text is constantly pointing to the vast political and social disparity, as well as the vast geographical distance separating the island of Utopia from a grossly unequal European mainland ruled in the interests of the powerful and the possessed. These disparities 
Thomas More points out time and again in the paratext of his work. I've already shown you one example of the paratext, that 15, 18 illustration of the island and, the, and, the, and its uh, visitors. That illustration belongs within a complex set of paratextual materials that evolve in the early editions and that contain the title page as well as illustrations, letters and poems of dedication and congratulation, maps of utopia, scraps of utopian writing. These materials, as they're found in early modern Latin and vernacular versions of utopia across Europe, were the object of a major 2008 study on your screens uh, undertaken by a team of researchers based at the University of Oslo and led by Terence Cave. These paratextual materials that are studied in that work offer a means of tracing the text's complex trajectory from its initial orientation to its later reception in different times and places. They point to a text capable of moving with its readers through time and of moving those readers to different responses, ranging in thematic terms from convergence to divergence and in formal terms from passive reproduction to active transformation and even cancellation. In these ways, the text has remained on the move in transit since 1516. It's been variously and controversially translated, remade and rethought across borders of language, culture and form. It's in this sense that I see it as a work not only addressing migration as a theme, but also as a work that reveals in the grain of its material history, migration as a process of the utopian imaginary. I see this migratory history of utopian imagining as being in an important sense, a history of the continuing invention of utopia, an invention that looks back to Moore's utopia, even in the act of writing over it. Let me say uh, for a minute what I mean here by invention, and that I'm then going to look at two, briefly at two utopian inventors, one from metropolitan France in the late 16th century, the other from Martinique in the early 21st century. What I'm hoping to show you is that these inventors contribute to a centuries old debate going back at least as far as Plato about what kind of invention a utopia is, whether it's the normative depiction of a replicatable model or a witty textual experiment that's as open-ended in, in its implications and complications as it is controversial. But key to that debate about what kind of invention a utopia is, of course, is the very meaning of invention. Invention has been well studied as a, as a term and a concept in a range of contexts and uses by word historians of the early modern period, such as Roland Green in 2013, um, who was working in the wake of Graham Castor uh, in, in 1964. Castor and Green agree that invention, the term invention by the 16th century is caught up in a long and uneven process of change as it moves from its classical sense, in which it means the discovery of something pre-existing, moving from that classical sense to its modern sense, the creation of something that's never existed before. Many of the ex examples of particularly usage that Castor finds of the word invention tend to fit Roland Green's view of 16th century invention as a semantic palimpsest in which to quote Roland Green, the tension, the tension between discovery and creation, for example, the tension built into the world, into the word, doesn't compromise its meaning. It is that meaning. That tension between discovery and conception helps, I think, to conceive of utopia as I think it's best understood, and that is as an invention in transit, as a work that discovers discovers and creates uh, all at the same time, a work that 
discovers classical Greek thinking about the best form of the state, even as it conceives of a new world that surpasses the old in its forms of political life, that uncovers, that uncovers, that discovers the serious problems of the present age, even as it conceives of those problems as too serious always to be taken seriously. That in the final, uh, a work that in the final instance emblematizes the 16th century palimpsest that is invention itself by holding discovery and conception in tension and by affording cooperation and competition between them. That tension between discovery and, and, and conception helps also, I think, to account for the course of utopia through history, for its history is one of continuing invention, an invention that looks back in turn to Moore's utopia in the act of writing over it. So let me just mention, as I prob pr uh, promised I would, two inventors of utopia writing in French, one early modern and one contemporary, who I think fit the wider pattern of utopia's entanglement with invention. Their contradictory understandings of utopia bear out my earlier suggestion that electricity continues to pass through Moore's text and its, and its reactivations in later hands. So the first of my two inventors of utopia is the mid 16th century Lyon humanist, Barthélemy Anneau. In 1559, Anneau published uh, the work you see in front of you, a revised edition of the first French translation of Utopia, the, the translation published first by Jean Leblanc nine years previously in 1550. So Anneau revises Leblanc's translation and adds to it an explanatory note by way of preface. So here's another paratext coming. Um, in that note, Anneau comments at length on, on, on the work of Moore and in particular on Moore's invention calling him a most cunning, I'm quoting now, a most cunning craftsman of ingenious invention and eloquence. Anno is quick to assert that Moore didn't intend by his utopia the normative depiction of a replicatable model. He didn't see his account of utopia as a blueprint for government in the real world. And he offers Moore's jokey naming of his island as a nowhere place, Utopia, as evidence to support his assertion that there is no blueprint in Moore's image of a most excellent form of government for a republic. This is uh, Anul, and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll translate, it's not, it's true. This is, the, uh, it is the um, Moore's depiction of the, society of utopia. It is not as true, such as anything of the kind ever existed or is actually to be found in some place, but such as it ought to be everywhere. And for this reason, he, Moore, named it the Republic of Utopia, which means of no place. I should say that I am quoting there the, the, the English translation in, in the cave um, text that's quoted on the slide. Well, what's going on here? Well, I think we can detect in Anul's reading of Moore an interpretation of the Platonist theory of forms as it relates to political philosophy. Moore, of course, had courted the association with Plato in various of the paratexts with which he surrounded his depiction of a society in which all things are held in common. And Anul picks this up and, and sees Moore as having portrayed after Plato, a form of government, the like of which particular governments strive to be, they attempt to be, but in respect of which they are and must always be an imperfect representation, a failure. What's important and absolutely crucial here is the failure doesn't detract from the utopian exercise. It is, uh, Part, it is the exercise, if you like. So 
Anu discovers in Plato the philosopher grounds for seeing Moore's idea of utopia as an archetypal form of the kind I've just described. Meanwhile, he finds in Plato the poet the key to understanding Moore's invention in utopia of a literary form. Anu claims that Moore designed his new world fiction in the same way as, I'm quoting Anu here, the ancient poets under the veil of mythological fable concealed true philosophy. But he then highlights a formal innovation, he says Moore has introduced to the uh, utopian form. And that's the, that's the idea of historical probability, the whole idea that this was a real visit uh, played by Raphael to an island on the edges of the world. That whole fiction, Anno says, causes us to view as a true story of new world travel what is in fact an imaginary account. So more for Anno is a master of invention because he mixes discovery and conception. He, invent, he mixes the discoveries of invention, the, the platonic material and the creative possibilities, new world travel and makes something uh, a kind of experiment with form that is Moore's utopia. Anul uh, continues the experiment in his own way. The year after he published his uh, edition of Utopia, Anul adapted Moore's text for his own purposes in his prose fiction, Alector of 1560. Alector takes as its main setting the city of Orb, which as its name suggests is a circular city and which Anul subjects, subjects to an extensive description. But surrounding this description in Anul's fiction is a new element, the element of, uh, new at least to the utopian tradition, the element of romance narrative. So romance narrative is the new addition by Anul to Moore's utopian mix of forms, producing in its turn a new invention, uh, a reactivation. Let me turn to the contemporary, the contemporary reinventor of utopia that I have in mind, Edouard Glissant. Glissant um, chose in his later work to challenge what he saw as a project of Western political and economic globalization, mondialisation, by proposing his notion of globality, mondialité, as a positive Caribbean alternative. And to do this, he takes a cluster of terms and notions that he sees as key to mondialisation, which he argues started with the European era of colonial expansion and the Atlantic slave trade. Glissant then redeploys that cluster in the alternative conceptual setting of mondialité. One, mem one, one term at the heart of this critically redeployed cluster of terms is, of course, the term monde, found both in mondialisation and then recast in mondialité. Another term is créole, a term initially uh, used sorry, to refer to white Europeans born in the colonies, but rec recast by Glissant and others as, as créolisation to name the historical process whereby several cultures meet to form unexpected hybrids. In his Traité du tout monde of 1997, Glissant suggested that the entire wor world was creolizing and that this process was at the heart of the mondialité that he offered as an alternative to mondialisation. I'm particularly concerned with the text that follows the Traité du tout monde in the same series, uh, uh, Glissant's uh, works on poetics, and that's the text entitled La Coué du Lamentin of 2005, a text in which Glissant foregrounds utopia as another member of this same cluster of terms that he argues once they've been taken, transposed from Europe to the Caribbean and radically reinvented may create the conditions for a better future. Glissant gives the title Utopia to a, sec a section of that work, uh, La Coué du Lamentin. And in that work, Glissant recalls the dictum of Gilles Deleuze that the function of literature and art is, and I quote Glissant now 
quoting Deleuze, that the function of art and literature is to inventer un peuple qui manque, to invent a missing people. Clisson adds to that thought, l'utopie est le lieu même de ce peuple. Utopia is the very pl place of this, this missing people that, that needs to be invented. Clisson connects this utopian invention of peoples and places with his own fiction. He suggests that in a, in a kind of happy coincidence, he'd actually written the first of his novels about the fictive Batuto people. Uh, that, that's uh, his novel Sartorius, before, before he then discovered that his practice as a literary novelist coincided with Deleuze's dictum and confirmed its, its, its pertinence. Glissant insists with Deleuze on the importance to the dictum of the language of invention. And I quote uh, Glissant here. Invention differs from creation in that invention adds to what's been created an obvious intention, a true extension of nature, in some sense, a future included in the present. So I'm interested in how Glissant wants to distinguish invention from creation here. And I want to add in the, the early modern thought, the thing that early moderns like Barthélemy Anno knew about invention, which was that it included also the discovery of pre-existing material. I think that Glissant shows his awareness of this when he places his work among what he calls the reactivations of utopian thought. Glissant pre presents his reactivation of utopia as radically different from the tradition that stretches back from Moore to Plato via Augustine. So his re reactivation of utopia will be, if you like, against Thomas More. In so doing, Glissant echoes Anou in bringing an interpretation again of that Platonist theory of forms to the reading of More's fiction. But Glissant's interpretation is not the same as Anou's. You remember that Anou looked to Plato in order to confirm his view that More didn't intend the normative depiction of a replicatable model. That's just not what Platonist forms are in Anou's reading. But Glissant, by contrast, suggests this is exactly what the forms are. They are normative models. And he suggests that the utopian tradition has traditionally acted in this very manner in political philosophy. It's set norms, it's imposed order in order to achieve perfection for its object. So what Glissant's claiming to do is to reinvent for globality, for mondialité, a creolizing model of utopia, one that accumulates many utopian inventions and put these, puts these into a non-hierarchical relation so as to create unexpected outcomes. I'm not sure that Glissant was right to think that this is a move against the utopian tradition, even from within that tradition, because I think of that tradition as broader, less normatively minded, and a more contested space than Glissant does. But I certainly think that it was both right and productive for Glissant to see his work as a reactivation of the tradition. Now, if I have just a moment or a, a minute or two left, I'd like to end by briefly evoking the project that uh, Justine kindly mentioned, that I, uh, in which I've been involved, a, a thoroughly contemporary reactivation of utopianism. Uh, a utopian reinvention, if you like, in which uh, uh, I've been involved. That, so about six years ago, I suppose now, an Oxford colleague, Wes Williams and I, formed an intergenerational East Oxford group at the Pegasus Youth Theatre in East Oxford, um, a group whose work was led by Wes and by Anne Harrod Arnott Phillips. The idea was, as a group, to cross some of the borders of contemporary Oxford. Here you might almost, almost, almost pictured like a, an island surrounded by green. So to cross some of the borders of contemporary Oxford, those that separate the collegiate university and the affluent residential areas of the city in the north and the west from the east part of the city not pictured on this map. Um, but also the borders 
that separate generation from generation in contemporary Oxford. Together, our intergenerational East Oxford group made an original theatre piece, Storming Utopia, which drew freely on the early modern utopian tradition, Moore's text, of course, but also Montaigne's essays and Shakespeare's plays, and used this, these uh, materials to think in the here and now about the questions that these works raise. What is it that makes the present intolerable? And how to resist the intolerable present and change it for the better. Uh, how to reintroduce, if you like, the principle of hope. Well, Storming Utopia, uh, the, and the project that housed it, is, is one that continues under the title I've used for this lecture, Utopia in Transit. And it continues life as a collaboration now between Durham University and the universities of Oxford and Kent. Back in 2016, though, we members of the cast all drew on our various experiences as we discussed plot lines for the show. Brexit, as you can imagine, and climate change, as you could also imagine, rose to the surface of our discussions and found their way into the show. But I'd like to finish just by mentioning some, a more surprising uh, thing that happened uh, to, to, to the project a uh, contribution to the project made by one of our cast, um, Asfai Abira, who, whom I thank for allowing me to talk about this today. Um, Asfai, who currently works as a butler in one of the Oxford colleges and who migrated to this country as a child refugee from famine and war in Ethiopia in the, um, in the late 1980s and early 1990s. Slowly and shyly, Asfai started to share with the group his story of migration across borders and the search for utopia, his narrative of survival and resilience. He spoke with sweetness and strength. He had things to say about his experience of this country that I, for one, found uncomfortable. We ended up making, as this is Asfai, we ended up making Asfai's story, it's Asfai in, in rehearsal. We ended up making Asfai's story a central plot line of our show, a plot line that worked in counterpoint to Shakespeare's play, The Tempest, which provided another of the show's plot lines. Asfai played himself in, in one of those plots and he doubled up in the role of Prospero in the other. Asfais had the good grace to say that he learned a lot from the experience. I'm sure that I learned more. It occurred to me, and I never thought, strange though it is to say, that Prospero in Shakespeare's Tempest was a refugee. I had no idea what it was to be an Ethiopian refugee growing up in the same country and at the same time as I was growing up here. So I suppose what I want to say is something that I learned something of how Asfai and the other members of the project see the world in its present state. I don't say the project of Storming Utopia was always easy or that it was or that it always ran smoothly. But I do count myself lucky to have been part of its entirely imperfect and yet truly utopian community of creative action. And I mention it now in closing, because I think it did in its own way exactly what Glissant was doing when he looked back to more and looked forwards into a better future included in the present. It accumulated many utopian inventions and put these into a non-hierarchical relation so as to expect, so as to create unexpected outcomes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Richard. Uh, it was just the perfect opening, the, the perfect keynote speech uh, for all the, 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 the subjects we, we, are, we are going to, to discuss all together. Um, I suggest we, we have um, 20 minutes of time uh, for uh, Q&A, questions and answers. I guess that 
people can uh, ask uh, questions in French as well. Yes, thank you. So, so you all know. Please uh, open your cameras, um, uh, at least the, the participants, so we, we can you know, be all together, if not uh, in Oxford. But uh, uh, yes, thank you. Um, thank you also, Richard, for, for uh, showing us uh, Oxford in the middle of the green. Actually, it's so sad that uh, you guys are not here uh, at its sunniest as ever and warm outside. And that would have been lovely. So I hope we, we, we will have another chance sometimes to, to meet in person and may, maybe here. Um, uh, maybe I, I've got a, a, a first question. I don't know if it's the easiest one, but it's something that I was uh, burning to ask. Actually, um, it's, that's very interesting the way uh, you show the history of uh, the concept of utopia and how nowadays it is basically a return uh, with the 21st century. So, the first question is why, why now, why uh, in the 21st century, but also why at the beginning of a new century, maybe it's something, and I, I've read it um, somewhere else, that is something that uh, comes back uh, at the beginning, uh, at a new beginning uh, of a century. So, so maybe uh, it's something to, to think about. Uh, and also how uh, the, the return of Utopia is now now about how concrete utopia can be. Um, because uh, as you said, the, the, the terminology uh, uh, has uh, evolved to something like chimeric, something that might never happen, but actually uh, we are thinking of, of things more practical. And I think that your example, your project of storming uh, utopia is a, is a good example actually. Um, Thank you. I'm just checking. I'm I'm uh, audible. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for those two wonderful questions. I mean, Justine, I think in a way you've asked questions that there that 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 will be in a better place to answer collectively at the end of our meeting. Um, I I don't know um, to what degree I want for my own part to argue that there's a particular um, a particular, particularly heightened relevance of Moore's utopia to the contemporary moment. Mm -hmm. I I feel like, um, I mean, I think that that, that 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 certainly it does feel like that. There's lots that connects these two moments, but I think one might what one might perennially find this, or or find elements at least in that very rich text that connect to a present. Um, I'm going to quote again um, my colleague Wes Williams, who um, I talked about in the lecture as well. He he has talked about the uh, the period to which Moore's text belong, the er the early modern period, as we often call it, as not so much early modern as eerily modern. In other words, uncannily modern in in some of it in its in its pre in many of its preoccupations. And, and I think there's a sense in, and I think that's a very helpful thought um, wittily put, and there's a sense in which um, when, you, when you look, when you, when you, when you study the, the reception history of Moore since 1516, that text has often, so often seemed eerily modern. Mm -hmm. um, but that I think is only a first answer to your question because I think that there may well be other, um, other, other contributions that that, mm -hmm. that that colleagues want to bring into that discussion as we go along and as they mm -hmm. survey or as they look at the, the the utopian tradition in its contemporary moment from their mm -hmm. perspective um on yeah on 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 the sort of uh empty the empty fool the chimerical real uh sort of the binary and through the um through through our understanding of utopia i suppose i i suppose i feel that that's all already contained in 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 the relationship between it again from my point of view takes me back to the material 
relationship, the material history of that of the work, Thomas More's Utopia, and and its materiality as a work. So, um, it's specifically the relationship between the the text, More's text, and its paratext. Mm -hmm. The text, the text, uh, as Anul says, you know, really. Um, exploits, excavates, uses, explores the, the, fic, the, 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 the highly specific fiction of a, of a real place out there in the world. Meanwhile, the paratext is the place in which uh, Moore finds ways, indirect ways of, of emptying that, that fiction of its, of its, referen of its referentiality. Mm -hmm. And there's a kind of, um, constant play between those two things mm -hmm. um which i think is part of what makes this such a productive um notion for for literary people but also for philosophers and so and and and, and others um are there any questions so far please raise your hand uh, so i can see you Yes, uh, Wes Williams. You, you just to mention, you also have the possibility um, to raise your hand virtually <laughs> at the bottom of your screen, <laughs> but uh, th that's fine, please. Um, hello, uh, just first of all, Richard, thank you so much for a, a great paper and a nice representation of the work, um, not least the work in Storming Utopia. Just to pick up on um, one or two things you said and also to kind of give a bit more meat to the bone, if you like, of, of the eerily modern. Um, it seems to me that one of the things that your sense of invention allows us to reintroduce uh, into the utopian tradition is precisely this kind of decalage or, or, or impossibility of ever quite turning um, no place into an actual place and yet to also recognize the sort of compulsive desire to do so that's written into that tradition. Mm. Um, in other words, um, even the word invention, you know, as you said, if one looks back to its Latin and early modern history, it means to, to discover or find something that is actually already there in some sense. Um, but in a modern sense, it, it's it, it's got a kind of ex nihilo idea that that somehow you're the inventor you're the inaugurator of this and that tension about uh you know the invention of america to use todorov's term or the invention of the other um you know that whole that whole idea that 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 utopia is one of those um tools for thinking with that uh the early modern period gives us um which are themselves rich in history before them, uh, but are also bound up with colonization, with the whole fantasy that the West, European culture, Greek or Roman culture, whatever you want to call it at that moment, um, is inventing in the sense of making new stuff um, and imposing itself on the world, turning a blueprint onto the world. Um, it's in that sense, I think, that the eerily modern is a, is a kind of an invention, if you like, a utopian invention in, in both sense of utopian. You know, it, it keeps the, the sort of energy, the electricity alive, but it also recognizes the, the kind of colonial impulse to, to turn something which is constitutionally unhoused into this space here and now. Um, I'm not sure if I'm, I'm making sense here, but it, it seems to me that that is one of the things that was also present in your in your sort of movement, if you like, between um, Anno and Glissant, and between then and whatever the various nows that we have are. Um, uh, and obviously, that was one of the things that we were we were working with in the show, um, uh, and hopefully, we'll carry on working with in in further iterations of it. Thank you very much, Wes. I mean. Yeah, I mean, one thing I I wanted to open up um, was exact was with a question of the relationship between utopian colonialism, 
and I did that just by just by sharing with you. I didn't really do much work of an, analyzing it actually, but the but you know those parts of the of the of the work in which um, the the European travelers to the New World talk about the relationship that their place in utopian society and um, their status in that society is as immigrants. But also, you know, so there's a kind of surprise there too, I think. And in a sense, uh, Moore's work is playing on, riffing on the idea of colonial, the colonial, the, the, the invention of the, uh, the discovery of the new world and the co colonial conquest of the new world. And at the same time, this is a place that isn't colonized by the Europeans. Um, they're welcomed into this place as strangers, but they're expected to leave again. Um, the utopians themselves in some ways behave as colonizers of surrounding islands. So this, so it's, yeah, it's again, both discovered by the text, that whole, that the, the whole colonial question and complicated by the text uh, in ways that I'm really interested to think more about. Thank you, Veronique. Uh, do you have a question? Yeah, I had a question. Thank you so much for this uh, uh, contribution uh, to, to understanding uh, Thomas More. I'm just wondering about the the idea of the commons and the enclosures, commons and the enclosure a movement that that began at that time. And I think that's the clear resonance. It's not only colonialism and and so yeah. on. The idea of dividing the land and having property, I think this is something that resonates right now. Land is power. Land is, you know, Chinese people are buying some places around here. And, and, and I just read that, that, that uh, you, you know, Bill Gates has, as a, as, is the biggest private owner of farmland. I mean, some, some crazy stuff about this idea of property and how we've forgotten about the commons. So maybe these were the very first borders, the borders of property. And, and that today really, uh, well, raise important questions. Who, who owns the land? How can we share the, this planet, especially uh, at the time of climate change and uh, things like that? Yeah, maybe. Well, I think I just want to thank you for bringing in an absolute, well, I think it's an absolutely fundamental point. Um, and, um, and again, uh, yeah, I mean, just, just to sort of, re just to gloss it really, um, I would say that I've tended to focus in, in what I had to say about the second of the two books of the Utopia in which mm -hmm. we have the description of the, you know, the, of the far flung island society uh, that, that the travellers have, have, from which they've returned and are talking about. Mm -hmm. yeah. But the first book of Utopia, as you well know, contains a, a, a savage critique of European society and very specifically names uh, private, yeah, the, 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 the whole system of enclosure of land in uh, 16th century England, which is contributing to a society in which um, the poor are criminalized. People are driven off common land and, and, and criminalized mm -hmm. because they have nothing left. Mm -hmm. So the, the whole, you know, another of those sorts of, of really constitutive tensions at the heart of utopia is the, is the tension or the, or the, or the yeah, the, the relation between the, the better place over there, the no place over there, and the, the, and, and, the, and, the, and the islands and continent of Europe which are in the hands of private property and uh, that, that, that kind of border. And um, I, I'm very pleased that you gave me an opportunity to sort of bring that into uh, my, my little presentation of Moore's text, because it's, it's fundamental. And I was wondering that the image that you showed of Oxford, uh, what is the date of the image? So if, if, if Wes is still on the, in, in here, he will be better placed than I am to comment on that, because it's 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 an invention of Wes's that that map not an inv an invention in the old sense a discovery I think it's from the 1950s but I've 
I'm afraid to say I can't answer more precisely than that. Um, uh, I mean, it's obviously... More... I am still here. It's actually older than that. Oh. Um, uh, it was, um, it's from the 19th century. So the mid, oh. actually, the, it's from the late 19th century. Um, but it was popular. You're right that it's popularized in the 1950s. Um, when certain kinds of guidebooks became available, but the, the image itself is from the late 19th century. Um, yeah. And just to add on it, uh, we had great fun, Veronique, with that map in Storm Utopia because it caused us to think about Oxford as a as an obviously an, a, an island or an archipelago of islands of stone. Mm -hmm. And uh, part of what we were doing in the show was to imagine what would happen if. Um, if the flood came to Oxford, mm -hmm. well, what would happen mm -hmm. uh, is that the central, those, those islands of stone that are the colleges in the center of the town, the low lying part of the city would have been, would be uh, submerged in water. And it's mm -hmm. post-industrial East Oxford, Cowley center, those parts of the city, which were, would poke out of the, the flood so we had refugees from central Oxford sort of rowing their way up to um, uh, up to up to Cowley Centre and and marooned on the island there trying to, you know, uh, finding themselves suddenly uh, be unhomed uh, in that way. Oh, I should say, sorry, um, that map has a long history. It's originally John Speed's map from 1605. So oh. it's, it is actually an early modern map, but the version that we have was reproduced in the 19th century and then again in the middle of the, the, the 20th century. So the, the, it's an imagination of, uh, of Oxford in 1605 um, when it first starts. I've just looked it up. It's very easily accessible. I'll put it in the, in the chat, if you like, um, so you can see, see where it's from. It's just that it reminded me of, of these maps where uh, the commons were destroyed and, and, yep. and the first enclosures, enclosures appeared uh, and, and separated the land. That's why I, I was also reminded of this. Thank you. Um, Thomas, Thomas has a, has a question for you. Yes, hi, also from my side and thank you for the organizers and the speakers. Um, I have always the impression that Utopia is a way broader and more important topic um, that it is actually being discussed, and I am happy that you will have um, this discussion. This um, topic was organized um, in the way. I have a question since um, Veronique, if I may, um, also uh, pointed out to the issue. Um, I'm a philosopher to start with, and I'm working on common sense. Uh, and I have a chapter on a book I'm writing, I'm working on, on utopia, as common sense and utopia. So it might be a little bit of a weird or a personal question, but um, uh, what I am particularly interested, um, Richard, is um, since you mentioned it, I mean, the utopia begins exactly by this. Um, my radical critique, as you mentioned, were um, in comparison to what happened at least in the English islands uh, back then, everything was held in common and so on. Um, the problem there is that, I mean, my problem with the book um, in general is that what I miss is actually thematization of the different, of the other, you know? So the commonality is actually a nivellation of the difference, what they have there. I mean, we have definitely better um, ways of, life conditions and we don't have the gender differences that we have um, in the beginning of the 16th century. But for example, you know, I mean, the Utopians still um, wage war and they still keep slaves. Um, and my question is whether this utopia is actually a utopia that would not be the heterotopia, for example, of Foucault or Deleuze um, later on. Um, so what we have in this utopia is the place where everything is in common, but where everything is the same, not different. Um, whereas I'm asking whether we could think of where we could use the notion of utopia um, to um, thematize also um, being together and in common with the different, or with something um, different. And um, in this account, I mean, what I, especially the 
question of migration was already important. And, and I mean, it is interesting that utopia begins with a big migration. I mean, utopia is, um, it, it doesn't have this exodistic or escapistic character, or maybe it has, um, but it is, it starts with the narrative of migration. And um, I was thinking of Spinoza a couple of hundred years later, um, who actually wrote that in order to have to, to be able to imagine things. Then you started by mentioning how close utopia and imagination are. That in order to be able to imagine things, we have to lend, to borrow our pictures from the others that we encounter. You know, so that we don't express with, that we don't express imagination. Now, this is this Kantian weird thing of Vorstellung, of something that we imagine as being in front of us, but we have to embody, to incorporate something that we already found surrounding us. Um, and this is what we acquire through getting in contact with the other. So the, mig the migrants, the refugees, are actually should be considered as constant sources of inspiration. And this is where then where the utopia um, character um, could um, appear. Um, and I was, my question is whether you see, uh, how would you respond to these considerations and whether um, there is place of such things still in more, because we don't have it in Campanella or in a, in a, any other early modern utopia I'm aware of, but I am still not, I am reluctant to give up more um, as a theorist that is too identitarian and is not capable of, ad of addressing the radical difference, you know, radical alterity or something like that. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Toma Thomas. I don't know how much I'm going to be able to answer that. It's a very difficult question you've asked about whether or how one might rescue more in that way. But I think what I would just, one brief thing I would want to say in response is, I'm just wondering to what degree, you know, you you said it earlier at some point that you, you were bothered by some of the things that happen in that Moore describes in his utopia, you know, that utopians were colonized and so on and so on. And I suppose what I wonder is if, I'm interested in why that bothers you. And I'm wondering if that bothers you because you are still assuming, or you are assuming that, uh, that, that Moore's utopia is, a normative description of a better society. Whereas I'm not sure that's what it is or what it's doing. Um, and I would, I think the alternative view, the one I was trying to sketch is that it, in, it invites that reading in order to take you somewhere else, in order to leave you in the state of mind of seeing that a thought experiment is going on in which an alternative is being imagined. Um, and at that level, if that's what you think, if you're happy to, to take that as a characterization of what Moore is doing to you as a reader, I think he is rescuable as a, as a or as a sort of, or his text is, is, res, is, is rescuable as a, as a kind of, yeah, performance, literary performance of, 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 of that kind of thinking. But I'm sorry I can't do better than that. And thank you all for your wonderful questions, um, some of which have appeared also in the chat, I can see, as well as uh, where's his map? Yes, yes. And th there is a question from someone who uh, had to, to leave, so maybe ah. she will contact you later. OK, I, I'm very sorry about that. Hopefully. Um, no, 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 please. Uh, the time, the timing is perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much, Richard, uh, from all of you, uh, all of us, sorry. Uh, that was so much interesting and uh, such a great opening, thanks to you. Uh, 